Some games really, really want to improve on their formula, and some, in that noble pursuit, go a little too far. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 video game changes fans absolutely hated. Starting with number 10, Gears of War Judgment, right from the start. You could tell Epic Games had something real good going with Gears of War. It's a series that has, for more or less, better or worse, remained mostly unchanged from the first game. Almost any major changes are met with a certain degree of hostility by the fan base too, because it all just worked right immediately from the start and everybody has their own preferred way that they expect these games to play. The only game that ever really deviated significantly from the formula was Judgment, the often forgotten fourth game in the series. Switching developers from Epic to People Can Fly, the game made some fundamental changes to the gameplay. Movement was a little faster, you switch weapons by pressing Y instead of the control pad, and at least at first you couldn't carry a shotgun and a rifle at the same time. The faster, more arcade-style pace made for a pretty fun campaign, but the multiplayer changes just weren't great. That and the new modes were pretty unbalanced and never really got better. <laughs> The game underperformed commercially, and even though on the whole I really don't think it's a bad game, actually a pretty good game, it's not necessarily what I would call a full Gears of War entry in terms of what the actual mechanics are. But more importantly, the multiplayer is a huge part of the Gears of War experience, and it was half-baked. A lot of the changes felt pretty arbitrary, at like changes for changes sake, and the changes that did matter mostly made the game worse. And number 9 is DMC Devil May Cry. The seventh console generation hit the Japanese gaming industry hard. Many of the biggest publishers struggled to adapt to a changing landscape, and because of that, a lot of once great gaming franchises nearly met their end. Like Devil May Cry, for example. After the somewhat lackluster sales of Devil May Cry 4, Capcom attempted to do something drastic with the series and handed it off to Western developer Team Ninja, who went on to reboot the series in a way that was supposed to give it more magic market appeal. Now, here's the thing. The game actually ended up being good. I don't think it's a bad game at all. I enjoy playing it, but nothing about it feels like a proper Devil May Cry game. Instead of being gothic and campy, DMC is grungy and juvenile. Combat is dumbed down. There's no lock on and in a move that really upset the fan base. The game was locked at 30 FPS, which all right. I don't really know why this was the case. It wasn't like the most complex game graphically of its generation or anything. Uh, but beyond that, though, Dante didn't even have uh, white hair. Like, there's a reason fans started calling him Dante, like with an O instead. Dante versus Dante. Uh, I don't know. That's not even taking into account the many ways the developers seem to go out of their way to make fun of the old games, which made fans of the original games less inclined to give the reboot a chance. The game failed to meet Capcom's sales expectations. Uh, it didn't go terribly. Like, it sold all right, but it wasn't the smash hit they wanted either. As far as Western developed entries of Japanese IPs go, hardly the worst. Again, I want to stress that the game is actually good. <laughs> But it's far from the best, and it's also incredibly far from what Devil May Cry actually normally is. What I'm saying is it's really understandable why it didn't do so well, and if it had just been a completely different IP, like a new one, it probably would have had a much better chance. At number 8 is The Bureau XCOM Declassified. Revealed back in 2010, years before the actual XCOM reboot by Fire Axis was even announced, the game that would become The Bureau, which was, uh, I guess, tangentially related to XCOM, uh, just about the only thing that seemed to carry over between the games is that you played some kind of government agent, and uh, there's aliens. That's about it. XCOM is a series mostly known for strategic gameplay, but this game had almost none of that. Instead, it's a third-person shooter that plays like a slightly more complex Mass Effect game if you didn't have role-playing in it. The whole thing ended up being a, a kind of weird and disappointing diversion from what XCOM fans would actually be interested in. Honestly, the original version of the game was first person and had you fighting bizarre geometric aliens. It was even further away from anything resembling XCOM, but it sounded more interesting than, you know, just kind of tangentially making an XCOM game out of this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
There aren't any sales numbers available that we can find, but it seems unlikely the game was able to make a profit for 2K, and along with mostly negative reviews, the game was quickly forgotten. It's more of an interesting failure than a complete disaster, but still an interesting failure is a failure. And number seven is Silent Hill Homecoming, another formerly Japanese developed game outsourced to Western developers during the seventh generation of consoles. Silent Hill Homecoming didn't actually get terrible reviews at the time, uh, but these days most fans see it as the beginning of the end for the series. Developed by Double Helix, the game had a greater emphasis on combat compared to previous Silent Hill games. Rather than just taking influence from the games, it took a lot of ideas from the divisive, to say the least, Silent Hill movie, like how the game transitions into the other world and the presence of the pyramid head monster. Uh, that's also what makes the game different from anything else on this list. The developers didn't really go out of their way to make something different. It just sort of happened that way because they clearly had different ideas as to what a Silent Hill game actually was. Like, they'd probably played them and also seen the movies and stuff got jumbled up in their heads and they probably thought about Resident Evil as well and it just kind of became a bit of a mush. For fans of the series who were used to the surreal atmosphere of the previous entries, this game felt like a major downgrade in a lot of areas. And the additional combat abilities actually made the enemy encounters significantly less scary. Overall, the game just isn't as grotesque and frightening as the best games in the series, even if the monster design is on point. And the soundtrack was, I mean, before I stop this entry, I have to say the soundtrack was really good. And number six is Metroid Other M. Uh, you know how this works, right? Great series, and then another developer comes in, doesn't know or doesn't understand what made the series good to begin with, and then botches the final product. 99% of the time, that is what happens. But sometimes it doesn't take someone outside to come in and ruin a sequel. Sometimes the original creator is perfectly capable of ruining a series all by themselves. Easily one of the most misguided and baffling sequels of all time, Metroid Other M, took what was originally a series all about exploration and environmental storytelling and turned it into a cutscene filled Metal Gear Solid like game with a very bad story and boring gameplay. Created by Metroid director Yoshio Sakamoto and developed by Nintendo SPD and Team Ninja, the creators of Ninja Gaiden, the game, I mean, when you say all of that, sounds like it should have been a slam dunk, but uh, it was, in fact, Metroid Other M. The game has almost nothing in common with previous Metroid games other than the main character. Uh, the gameplay is completely different, exploration's mostly gone, other than a few hidden upgrades dotted around. There's almost no non-mandatory backtracking, and the powers aren't earned through exploration, but rather authorized by Samus's boss, and one of the most bizarre excuses I've ever seen in a game for why you don't get all of your weapons at the start. Seriously, the reason Samus can't use her Varia suit that protects from the heat in the super hot lava is not because she doesn't have it, it's because her boss hasn't given her the thumbs up yet. The whole game is filled with WTF moments like that too. It's a total mess. One of the biggest missteps for a series that's normally associated with very high quality. For years, it seemed like this game was responsible for killing Metroid and considering the sales and fan reception, it probably almost did. And number five is Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, easily one of the weirdest turns for a game series out there. The Xbox 360 sequel took the series as mostly known for being a 3D platformer collectathon into a game about building vehicles and solving various challenges. Uh, that's really what you're doing most of the game too, creating different types of vehicles to overcome the variety of challenges that the game throws at you. Now, it's a very creative sandbox game and it's pretty clever and can be fun once you understand how the game wants you to think, but it's almost nothing like the previous games where the emphasis was on platforming. The game left a lot of fans just completely scratching their heads, but if all it was is a little diversion until the third banjo came out, then whatever, it's just a side game, right? That was more than 10 years ago, and Rare has not made a proper sequel to the Banjo-Kazooie games. At this point, it seems unlikely that they're gonna. And number four, the third birthday, Parasite Eve. The Parasite Eve series is not one that we would really call mega consistent to begin with. The first game is an interesting mix of survival horror and RPG. The sequel is more of a standard action horror game. And the third birthday is, um, I, I don't know what the hell the third birthday is. I mean, besides completely insane, I can't even begin to describe the story. The gameplay is almost as crazy as the story. So I'm probably not gonna be able to describe that too well either. 
Uh, it's a third person shooter, but it has this bizarre twist that the main character has the ability to body jack humans nearby. So a lot of the gameplay involves swapping between soldiers mid mission to access new areas or get weapons necessary to fight the enemy. It's all tied together, like I said, with a totally incomprehensible story. I, I think probably one of the most incomprehensible to ever be in a video game. It's nonsense, and the more you think you understand it, the less you actually know. I'm not going to try to summarize it because I'm not going to be able to. The whole thing has almost nothing in common with Parasite Eve other than the main character uh, who acts like a completely different character compared to how she was in the first game. Uh, seriously, the only way to know these games are the same series is if someone told you that they were or you notice that they both say Parasite Eve on them. Somehow the game actually reviewed okay. I, I don't know the reason for that because it is not something I would review well. <laughs> Despite that, sales were fairly low and the Parasite Eve franchise has been dead in the water ever since. And number three is Dynasty Warriors. Nine of all the games out there that try to go open world, Dynasty Warriors is probably the worst. Seriously, I did the before you buy on this channel, and if you go back, you could just detect the disdain in my voice. I was so disappointed in that game. Before 9, these games had a formula, and what they did, they did really well. Now, by 2018, they were starting to get a little bit stale, like we'd seen that formula a lot of times at that point, and the more interesting versions were starting to be the other franchises that they did Warriors for, like Hyrule Warriors, for instance. But out of all the ways they could have refreshed the series, going open world was uh, the worst possible option. So instead of taking place within well-crafted levels, the entire game takes place uh, in empty fields. Basically, if you know what an abandoned MMO looks like, if you've ever logged into an MMO that is way past its prime, that's basically what this game looks like. You got all these way too big of areas, you do basic boring quests, and then you have the large scale battles, which are fun. I'm not gonna say that they're not fun, like they're the, the only good part of the game really, but they almost always take place in a flat, boring field with nothing else going on. For such a long running franchise, it was hard to imagine them putting out a main entry this like frustratingly horrible but they did that not a lot else to say just look at it that's what they did and number two is Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. The original Fallout games were really great for their reactive world, and they were filled to the brim with a lot of role-playing opportunities to play a character however you wanted to. So what did Interplay do when they brought the series onto consoles for the first time? Well, take everything like that out. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel is just a bad Diablo clone. It's got weak combat, dull environments, and a nothing story, to say the least. Instead of being open like the original games too, totally linear. Instead of being able to use your own character, do pre-made ones to choose from, whole things dumbed down, basic and dull. Basically, it's somebody saying, um, wow, console gamers are dumber, so they'll just think that this is the same thing as Fallout, right? Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance managed to be something completely different from the PC games by virtue of just being a really fun game, but Fallout Brotherhood of Steel uh, did not get anywhere near that. At number one is Tony Hawk Ride. By 2009, the Tony Hawk franchise was on life support, and it needed a new direction if it wanted to survive. You can probably tell by my tone that's not what happened. <laughs> Seriously, you start to go into that cadence, and it's like, well, either you're reading a story to a child, or there's some element of facetiousness here. Yeah, Activision went and made things way worse for Tony Hawk. <laughs> Tony Hawk Ride is the one with the plastic skateboard peripheral. Don't need to say anything else. That's enough. You know, game was basically unplayable, and that skateboard controller was hard to use in even the best conditions. It also broke frequently, and it wasn't fun. Like, it was a bad gimmick. Just terrible. Why would you do that? The game got terrible reviews, too, especially for the time, and sales were pathetic for a Tony Hawk game. Why? Because, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe you made a Tony Hawk game that required a plastic skateboard peripheral. Yeah, Wii Fit is fun. Tony Hawk is a completely different thing from Wii Fit. Don't do this. Like, this is a series that just can't seem to catch a break because when they decided to go back to the classic gameplay of the original games, the game was still terrible. Like, do you remember Pro Skater 5? It was an attempt to be like the old games, but really sucked because whoever developed, I don't even remember at this point, didn't know what the hell they were doing. I mean, at least we finally got the Pro Skater 1 and 2 remakes, and even if those end up being the last Tony Hawk games we ever get, at least they went out on a high note.
And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. And we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.